What's up people, welcome back to Chatterdox. I'm down here in central Pennsylvania vacationing in the tiny estates cabin area. It's beautiful out here. Yesterday I had a great chat with my friend Dr. Fima Mashrad about AFib. Now what is AFib or atrial fibrillation? Your heart has two top chambers or atria and two bottom chambers or ventricles. Normally the two top chambers contract and push the blood into the bottom chambers and then the two bottom chambers which are the main pump of the heart contract and push the blood throughout the body. Now in people who have AFib, the two top chambers instead of contracting sequentially, they do wiggly, like this, wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. And this may cause problems like heart failure, blood clots, stroke, or so many other problems. The problem is so many people have AFib and they don't even know it. So I called up my friend, Dr. Fima Masharet, who is a great doctor. He did his medical school at the Mayo Clinic and then his internal medicine residency at Cornell, New York. And then he worked as a hospitalist in University of Pennsylvania and UC San Diego for five years and now he is a second year cardiology fellow at University of Washington. His main interest and area of work is AFib. But before that, let me remind you again, if you're new here, please, please consider subscribing. And also if you like our videos, hit the like button and share them with your friends. Now let's dive in. Yeah, how are you doing, Fima? How's it going? I'm doing really well, Sam. I am glad to be here with you today. Um, I feel like this has been, uh, we've been talking about doing this for a while, and I've been very uh, excited about it. And um, I'm excited to be a part of any program that you are creating. You're one of the most uh, creative medical professionals um, with a, a voice that I'm excited to help uh, grow and uh, expand your platform and reach. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, you always have been a great help to me. Um, I always like to tell the story of our friendship. Uh, I, when I came here to the United States a few years ago for my medical education FEMA was one of the first people who helped me get into the medical system he was an attending physician back uh, there in um, University of Pennsylvania and it started shadowing him then we became like friends and then um, you know he wrote me like letters of recommendations that helped me to get into residency and um, our friendship uh, has been great since uh, although it's like a little bit of uh, long distance right now so why don't you why don't you tell us about um, yourself a little bit just outside of the world of the medicine. Yes, uh, there is in fact a world outside of medicine for physicians. Um, I'm very happy to be here in Seattle as a cardiology fellow um, with my wife, Dr. Ellie Mendelson, who is a physician at the University of Washington. Um, we live here in Seattle with our 10-year-old uh, Tibetan Spaniel, who you might hear bark from, from time to time if we have in intruders outside of the home, you know. Awesome, yeah, that's great. So let's begin with our questions. Atrial fibrillation. Tell us what the hell is atrial fibrillation. AFib is essentially a disorganized heart rhythm of the, of the top chambers of the heart, especially the top left one, the left atrium. Um, you get a lot of uh, high frequency um, extra beats uh, that are much, much faster than normal. So it's a very, very big problem. It's very, very common. Um, and it's something that we are actively trying to improve our treatments for. So why does it happen? For many years, the, the philosophy about AFib has been that the pulmonary veins, which return blood from the lungs, um, are common sources of these extra beats called PACs. And uh, when these PACs are premature atrial conditions, contractions occur um, at the right time and in the right substrate as we call it or the right left atrium that has some um, fibrosis um, essentially those um, conductions can get stuck and can, can cr create um, re-entrant circuits that essentially go around and, and around and keep activating the left left atrium um, hundreds of times a minute um, instead of the usual 60 beats per minute that the um, sinus node the usual pacemaker of the heart prefers to run at so when the atrium takes over with this disorder organized, chaotic, many hundreds of signals per second, um, it doesn't allow for the heart's normal 60 beats per minute um, impulse to actually occur. So, so who are those people? Like, who is at higher risk for this disease? So, uh, the people who are at most risk for having AFib are those who we can kind of divide that into modifiable and unmodifiable um, risk factors. So, the unmodifiable risk factors are really um, age. There is a direct linear relationship um, between their risk for atrial fi fibrillation. And what is old? Because I feel old already, like 35. 
I know we 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 come back from our kayaking and our arms are sore and uh, yeah. So um, the, there isn't necessarily an age. It's it's more of a the older you are, the more at risk you are. In in addition, um, male gender is associated with an increased risk of atrial fibrillation. There's also genetic factors as well. Um, uh, the risk of having AFib in a first degree relative of somebody with AFib is about 40 per. Percent. Um, there are several really important uh, modifiable risk factors. By that, I mean hypertension is really uh, one of the two big ones um, in addition to obesity. But interestingly, recently, there's also been a, uh, a little bit of a discovery that um, extreme long endurance athletes, long-term endurance athletes, actually also have some evidence of left atrial dilation, um, which we've talked about that problem of the stretching of the left atrial chamber, but um, that seems to be an important risk factor for AFib as well. In addition, um, smoking is associated with incident atrial fibrillation as well. In addition to smoking, um, diabetes is a really, really important risk factor for so many reasons. Uh, and then finally, there's been an increasing amount of work done studying the relationship between alcohol intake and atrial fibrillation. There is a linear relationship between the two. It seems to be, based on recent data, stronger in men. I tend to not necessarily say to a patient to not drink at all. I, 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 th I think we have to uh, recognize where, where patients are and sort of what they enjoy in life. At the same time, if somebody is having recurrent AFib, um, then it's really also affecting their quality of life. Um, and we could reduce the amount of these extra beats and things that, and their AFib burden um, by at least uh, discussing alcohol um, and trying to re reduce it to one or less, or rather um, four or less per week. I think if, <laughs> if you could address all of those things, you, you, you would probably dramatically reduce um, the amount of AFib that we have, but obviously you can see that um, any one of those is challenging. And when you put multiple ones together along with the other challenges that people face in their lives, it's actually very difficult. Two others, lastly, um, one of them is very common. Heart failure is extremely common. So along with that um, come structural changes in the heart and therefore atrial fibrillation. The sicker someone's heart, the more likely they are to have these arrhythmias. So say I'm someone who has some of these risk factors, you know, I'm like in my 40s or 50s, you know, I'm obese, you know, have a little bit of high blood pressure, I drink, I smoke, I enjoy my life. How would I know if I have atrial fibrillation or not? Because you said uh, this could be a risk of so many other problems. So, but how, how do I know if I have it or not? What's the symptoms like, you know? That's a really, really good question. Symptoms are variable for AFib. We have some patients who actually don't, um, don't know that they're in atrial fibrillation in the same way that many people don't know that they have diabetes or hypertension. But uh, most other people do actually de develop some kind of symptoms, um, whether that is uh, palpitations, shortness of breath, dizziness, um, even chest pain, um, decreased exercise tolerance. Um, so if you have any of those symptoms on a, enough to affect your life or enough to concern you, then you should discuss them with your doctor. So uh, I know you briefly mentioned, but what are the, the most common or like the biggest complications of AFib? Like why should I be worried if I have it at all? You, you can imagine that um, in comparison to when blood is flowing mm -hmm. through the atrium and the blood gets to move around completely, um, everything is flowing very nicely versus an atrial fibrillation, there's going to be pockets of blood that pool, especially near the walls, that are just not moving well. And when blood doesn't move well, unfortunately, it has a tendency to form clots. Um, that's a major risk factor for downstream vascular damage. And the, the, the biggest thing we worry about is stroke. Um, although these clots, if they break off, can um, really go to any organ, including the kidneys, the bowel, um, the, the lower extremities. But it's really the brain mm -hmm. that we worry uh, the most about with regard to um, AFib. So say uh, if you found that I have AFib, um, what are you going to do for me? Like does it have any treatment? So uh, a number of studies over the years have looked at um, whether it is sufficient to um, when somebody has atrial fibrillation to control their rate um, in order to reduce their symptoms uh, and make them feel better versus a number of therapies, medical and uh, electrical, um, in order to um, get them out of atrial fibrillation and put them back into normal sinus rhythm. In addition to that, um, treatment also involves reducing the triggers mm -hmm. for atrial fibrillation. Everything from um, alcohol use to these increased atrial 
um, extra beats, which can be due to heightened states of sympathetic activation um, and heart failure, which predisposes people to volume overload. Essentially, any of these things that irritate um, the left atrium will predispose somebody um, to having more atrial fibrillations. And also, uh, in addition to all these treatments, there's uh, decreasing the risk of making blood clots and having stroke with the blood thinners if it's indicated. That's exactly right. You know, a young person without any of those risk factors uh, may not need to be on um, anticoagulation, but increasingly with age and those other risk factors, um, you're pretty much going to need to be on lifelong anticoagulation. So just to to wrap up things, any um, advice for people to um, prevent any possible AFib? Yeah, I think the biggest thing really um, is to find a doctor, a cardiologist um, that you really um, can work with on the uh, reduction of these risk factors. Um, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, um, uh, sleep apnea, all of these things really require a, a, in a, a therapeutic relationship with your physician, somebody who can really trend these things over time um, and provide you with the data as well as encouragement um, to pursue those changes in order to reduce your risk. Um, but I think it's also important in that sense to um, trust when your physician say, hey, you know, maybe we need to change our treatment in, in order to um, improve how much AFib you're, you're having. So I think there's a distinction to be made between strategies to re reduce somebody's AFib and then also make sure that people are um, understanding of the importance of blood thinners um, and reducing somebody's stroke risk, which is ultimately the most disabling um, possible effect of atrial fibrillation. Uh, that was great. Um, if any of you people have any other questions, just hit us below in the comments. Or if you want me to talk to Dr. Masheret again about any other cardiology related topic, um, just ask below. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and share this video with your loved ones. And thank you for watching and stay healthy.